Sean Greenhalgh. Sean Greenhalgh is a British art forger. Over a 17 year period, between 1989 and 2006, he produced a phenomenal range of forgeries. Teaming up with his brother and elderly parents, who fronted the sales side of the operation, he successfully sold his fakes internationally to museums, auction houses, and private buyers, accruing nearly a million pounds. The family have been described by Scotland Yard as possibly the most diverse forgery team in the world, ever. However, when they attempted to sell three Assyrian reliefs using the same provenance as they has previously, suspicions were raised. Apprehended, Sean Greenhill was sentenced to prison for four years and eight months in November 2007. The Victoria and Albert Museum in London held an exhibition of Greenhill's works from January 23 to February 7, 2010. The Metropolitan Police's Art and Antiques Unit built a replica model of the shed where the works were created and labeled Greenhill the most diverse art forger known in history. Many of his fakes, including the Amana Princess, Risley Park Lanx, and works by Barbara Hepworth and Thomas Moran, were displayed. Family Roles Greenhall's family was involved in the Garden Shed Gang. They established an elaborate cottage industry at his parents' house in the Crescent, Bromley Cross, South Turton, which is about 3.5 miles 6 kilometers, north of Bolton Town Centre. His parents, George and Olive, approached clients, while his older brother, George, J.R., managed the money. Other members of the family were invoked to help establish the legitimacy of the various items. These included Olive's father who owned an art gallery, a great-grandfather who it seemed had had the foresight to buy well at auctions, and an ancestor who had apparently worked for the mayor of Bolton as a cleaner and was given a Moran painting. Sean Greenhill left school at 16 with no qualifications. A self-taught artist, undoubtedly influenced by his job as an antiques dealer, he worked up his forgeries from sketches, photographs, art books and catalogues. He attempted a wide range of crafts, from painting and pastels and watercolors, to sketches, and sculpture, both modern and ancient, busts and statues, to bar relief and metalwork. He invested in a vast range of different materials, silver, stone, marble, rare stone, replica metal, and glass. He also did meticulous research to authenticate his items with histories and provenance, for instance, faking letters from the supposed artists, in order to demonstrate his ownership. Completed items were then stored about the house and garden shed. The latter probably served as a workshop as well. A quote from an amazed Scotland Yard detective who searched the house gives a sense of greenhouse industry. A next-door neighbor recalled, I was finding bits of pottery and coins around the edges of the garden over twenty years back, bits of metal with old kings on. While this sounds like materials were openly displayed, it was perhaps not quite that obvious. Angela Thomas, a curator from the Bolton Museum, actually visited the family at home prior to the purchase of the Amana Princess and reported nothing untoward. Yet for all his daring, he once boasted that he could knock up a Moran watercolor in half an hour and claimed to have completed an Amana statue in three weeks. Sean Greenhill needed the help of his parents. At the trial it was said by the lawyer, Brian McKenna, that his mother, Olive, b. 1925, made the phone calls, because he was shy and did not like to use the telephone. Olive may have been a peripheral figure, but Sean's father, George, born 1923, was more involved. He was the frontman who met face to face with potential buyers. He looks honest, he's elderly and he shows up in a wheelchair. On one occasion, trying to interest the Bolton Museum in an Amana princess, an ancient Egyptian statuette about the size of a gnome, George Essa told them he was thinking about using it as a garden ornament. The parents were perhaps most important because they helped establish a logical explanation for why the greenhouse had possession of such items in the first place, namely as family heirlooms. It allowed them to offload items when they were discovered as fakes, such as the Edred reliquary, and an L.S. Lowry painting, The Meeting House. The Amarna Princess 
In 1999 the Greenhouse began their most ambitious project yet. They bought an 1892 catalogue which listed the contents of an auction in Silverton Park, Devon, the home of the 4th Earl of Egremont. Among the items listed were eight Egyptian figures. Using the leeway this vague description allowed, Greenhow manufactured what became called the Amana Princess, a 20-inch statue, apparently made of a stunning translucent alabaster. It later emerged within a panorama documentary that he had bought the tools to produce this masterpiece from B&Q. Done in the Egyptian Amana period style of 1350 BC, the statue represents one of the daughters of the pharaoh Orkhenaten and Queen Nefertiti, mother of Prince Tutankhamun. At the time, as Greenhill had researched, only two other similar statuettes were known to exist in the world. He knocked up his copy in his shed in three weeks out of calcite, using basic DIY tools and making it look old by coating it in a mixture of tea and clay. George then approached Bolton Museum in 2002, claiming the Amana was from his grandfather's forgotten collection, bought at the Silverton Park auction. He pretended to be ignorant about its true worth or value, but was careful to provide the letters Sean had also faked, showing how the artifact had been in the family for a hundred years. In 2003, after consulting experts at the British Museum and Christie's, the Bolton Museum bought the Amana Princess for PS 439,767. It remained on display until February 2006. How they were caught Perhaps buoyed up by the fact that they had so successfully duped the experts the greenhouse tried again, using the same Silverton Park provenance. They produced what were purportedly three Assyrian reliefs of soldier and horses, from the palace of Sennacherib in 600 BC. The British Museum examined them in November 2005, concluded that they were genuine, and expressed an interest in buying one of them, which seemed to match a drawing by A. H. Lyard in its collection. However, when two of the reliefs were submitted to Barnum's auction house, its antiquities consultant Richard Falkiner spotted an obvious fake. Barnum's consulted with the British Museum about various suspicious aspects, and the museum then spotted several unlikely anomalies. The horses' reins were not consistent, or atypical with respect to other Assyrian reliefs. And the cuneiform inscription contained a spelling mistake, an absent diacritical mark which was considered extremely unlikely in a piece destined for the eyes of the king. These concerns became full-blown suspicion when George seemed too willing to part with the items at a low price. The museum contacted the Arts and Antiquities Unit of Scotland Yard, and 18 months later the family was arrested. Monies involved had the Greenhouse managed to sell all 120 artworks they had offered it is estimated that they could have earned as much as PS 10M. This would have made the average value of each piece more than PS 83,000, although monies received varied between PS 100, for the Edred Reliquary, and PS 440,000, for the Amana Princess. The Greenhouse did not manage to offload most of their works. Many which they did sell, such as the Edred Reliquary, purportedly were undersold, garnering only minimal amounts. Others, such as the Lowry painting the meeting house only gained in value from their repeated resale, which would not have benefited the greenhouse. As time went on, more ambitious, expensive pieces of work were produced, some of which did sell, like the Risley Park Lanks. However, these were subject to more scrutiny and indeed it was one of these, the Assyrian reliefs which led to their exposure and arrests, which suggests that the longevity of their scam was concentrated on the passing off of lower-level items. Balanced against this must be the success of sales to private individuals. They are unlikely to have had the same level of expertise at their disposal as institutions, and are probably less willing to advertise their losses once the forgeries were detected. Certainly they have not had the same exposure as the debacle surrounding the Bolton Museum, for example. Two individual buyers, wealthy Americans have been noticed, but only after they donated their purchase to the British Museum. Another piece sold to an unnamed private buyer came to light when the Art Institute of Chicago announced that the fawn, a ceramic sculpture on display since 1997 is the work of the 19th-century French master Paul Gauguin, 
was also a forgery by Sean Greenhow. The museum purchased the sculpture from a private dealer in London, who had bought it at a Sotheby's auction in 1994. In addition, the bank records of the greenhouse only went back six years, so in the final analysis the exact amount of monies involved over the 17-year scam has not been determined. What is known as the two Halifax accounts, one containing PS 55173 and the other PS 303646 were frozen, pending a confiscation hearing in January 2008 and Sean Greenhill was convicted for conspiracy to conceal and transfer PS 410,392. Estimates of the amount of money the Greenhills actually made vary from PS 850,000 to PS 1.5 million. Motivations The Greenhill family did not appear to make much use of the money they gained. They lived a far from lavish life in a shabby council house. Among their possessions were an old TV, battered sofa, and a Ford Focus, but not a computer. According to Detective Sergeant Vernon Rapley, from the Met's Art and Antiques Unit, the conditions were relatively frugal even abject poverty. Olive Greenhall claimed that she had not even travelled outside of Bolton. As they did not display wealth, explanations other than desire for money have been proposed. Police suggested that Sean Greenhill was motivated less by profit than by resentment at his own lack of recognition as an artist. This general hatred became a need to shame the art world, and show them up. On the other hand, defense lawyer Andrew Newtel characterized Sean Greenhill as a shy, introverted person, obsessed with one outlook and that was his garden shed. The forgeries were an attempt to perfect the love he had for such arts. By implication, the forgeries were a mere unintended, if unfortunate, consequence. Known forgeries 44 forgeries were discussed during the trial, and 120 were known to have been presented to various institutions. However, given the family's bank records only extended back for a third of the period they were operating, and Sean Greenhouse's high level of productivity, there are probably many more. On raiding the Green Hall home police discovered many raw materials and scores of sculptures, paintings and artifacts, hidden in wardrobes, under their bed and in the garden shed. In fact, there can be little doubt that there are a number of forgeries still circulating within the art market. A description of known forgeries includes the following. 1989. Edred Relicleary. A small 10th century silver vessel, containing a relic of the True Cross of Jerusalem. George Greenhow turned up dripping wet at Manchester University, claiming he had found it in a river terrace, at Preston. University determined Bessel was a fake. But unsure about the wood. Purchased it for a Pico Second 100. The subject of an academic thesis, 1990. Samuel Peplu's still life painting, purportedly inherited from Olive's grandfather sold for PS 20,000. However, paint began to flake off and buy a council check. Scotland Yard failed to make an arrest at the time due to organizational restraints. 1992. The Risley Park Lanx A Roman silver plate bought for PS 100,000 by private buyers and donated to the British Museum, who displayed it as genuine replica. 1993-1994. Thomas Moran's sketch and watercolor acquired by Bolton Museum. The former was a gift given by the Green Hells. The latter was purchased for PS 10,000, 1994. The Fawn. A ceramic sculpture by Paul Gauguin. Authenticated by the Wildenstein Institute, sold at Sotheby's auction in 1994 for PS 20,700 to private London dealers, Howie and Pillar. Bought by the Art Institute of Chicago in 1997 for $125,000. On display until October 2007, 1995. Anglo Saxon Ring. Tried to sell it through Phillips Auctioneers. Determined by British Museum to be a fake, 1995. 24 sketches by Thomas Moran sold in New York. Police believe up to 40, worth up to PS 10,000 were created by Greenhow, six or seven of which are unaccounted for. He claimed each one only took him 30 minutes to forge, 
and that a former mayor of Bolton had given them to an ancestor of his who worked for the mayor as a cleaner, L.S. Lowry. The meeting house, a pastel, one of a clutch of paintings. The greenhouse claimed it was a 21st birthday present by Olive's gallery owner father, and even that some were given by Lowry himself. They had copied letters from the artist, inserting their names in to make it look like they were great friends. For example, this letter dated June 16, 1946. Dear George, thank you very much for your recent letter and check for the paintings. I have about finished that but I will hold on to it until I am ready. I will slip round to the yard on Wed L.S. Lowry. Received 45.0.0 for paintings. One of the Lowrys, perhaps the one mentioned above, sold as a replica, for somewhere between several hundred pounds, and P.S. 5000. Eventually put up for auction by new owners in Kent as genuine item, for P.S. 70,000, 1999. Two gold Roman ornaments. George Greenhow withdrew them from Christie's when the auction house wanted to do a scientific analysis on them, Barbara Hepworth Goose Sculpture. Only a photograph known to exist, before item lost in the late 1920s. The Greenhow's claimed it was given to the family by the curator of a museum in Leeds in the 1950s. Worth approximately P.S. 200,000 it was later sold to the Henry Moore Institute in Leeds for P.S. 3000, work by Otto Dix. Stolen from Dresden in 1939. Apparently recovered by the Greenhouse, then presented to the Tate Gallery, work by Man Ray, another Paul Gauguin, a vase, an ancient Celtic fibula, or brooch, Horatio Greenough. Best of Thomas Jefferson, sold at Sotheby's for P.S. 48,000. And or Thomas Chatterton, Henry Moore. A carved stone head by Henry Moore which Greenhall SNR tried to convince the Tate Modern, London to buy, claiming to have got it via his grandmother, 2003 Amana Princess, a statuette, in the family for a hundred years. Authenticated by the British Museum and Sotheby's, bought by Bolton Museum for P.S. 440,000, it was on display for three years. A police raid on the Greenhall home discovered two more copies, 2005. Three Assyrian marble reliefs from Nineveh, including one of an eagle-headed genie and another of soldiers and horses. They were dated by the British Museum at around 681 BC, supposedly from the palace of Sennacherib, and thought to be worth around PS 250,000 to PS 300,000. But alerted by Bonhams, their discrepancies were revealed, and the forgery exposed. Reactions In the end, Greenhouse's artistic ability was downplayed. Detective Sergeant Rapley of the Metropolitan Police Arts and Antiquities Unit said looking at them now I'm not sure the items would fool anyone, it was the credibility of the provenances that went with them. Despite this claim the list of experts and institutions who were fooled is long, and includes the Tate Modern, the British Museum, the Henry Moore Institute, and auction houses Bonhams, Christie's, Sotheby's and other experts from Leeds to Vienna. The fawn was displayed at the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam. While the Amana Princess went on display at the South Bank Hayward Art Gallery, in an exhibition opened by the Queen. Other unnamed galleries, and various private collectors were fooled as well. In fact, institutions proclaimed the works and their achievement in obtaining them. The Art Institute of Chicago described the fawn sculpture as a major rediscovery, and included it in their definitive exhibition on Gauguin. Bolton Museum hailed their purchase of the Amana Princess as a coup, calling George Greenhall a nice old man who had no idea of the significance of what he owned. After the trial, Bolton Museum scrambled to distance itself and described itself as blameless insisting that it had followed established procedure. The presiding judge, William Morris, exonerated the institution and any council staff involved preferring to focus on what he saw as misapplied talent and an ambitious conspiracy. While the Metropolitan Police Arts and Antiquities Unit would only admit that Green Hell had succeeded to a degree. However, the general public was notably more cynical in its reaction, being unimpressed by what they perceived as the experts' incompetence, and the law's heavy-handedness. Richard Falkiner, the antiquities expert from Bonham said, 
I took one look at the relief and said don't make me laugh. It was an obvious fake. It was far too freshly cut, was made of the wrong stone and was stylistically wrong for the period. The Antiques Rogue Show On January 4, 2009, BBC Two broadcast a dramatization of the Green Hell story called The Antiques Rogue Show, a play on the title of the popular BBC series Antiques Road Show, already used by headline writers. In a letter from prison to the Bolton News, Sean Greenhow made a number of complaints about the depiction of himself and his family, calling the drama character assassination. Career after release Following Sean Greenhow's release early in 2010, he launched a website, selling his artworks. These comprise works the website describes as examples of my old style of work. Fakes, although signed and sold as works by him, as well as sculptures done in my own style. A member of the Metropolitan Police Art and Antiques Squad stated if a work is not copyrighted, it is not illegal to copy that work and sell that copy, as long as it is made very clear the work is not an original. Sean Green Hall appears in and is credited as craftsman in the BBC documentary The Dark Ages, An Age of Light, episode number 4. Gallery Pictures of the family can be found attached with most articles cited. The best source of images of the forgeries themselves is the BBC article. Those available include The Amarna Princess, unspecified head of a statue, the Syrian Relief, Risley Park Lanx, Hepworth Goose, Moran Painting of Yellowstone, Faked Letter, Detail of Lowry Painting, The Meeting House. Also included in the BBC article. The 1892 catalogue, Sean's Toolments, while his older brother, George, J.R., managed the money. Other members of the family were invoked to help establish the legitimacy of the various items. These included Olive's father who owned an art gallery, a great-grandfather who it seemed had had the foresight to buy well at auctions, and an ancestor who had apparently worked for the mayor of Bolton as a cleaner and was given a Moran painting. Sean Greenhow left school at 16 with no qualifications. A self-taught artist, undoubtedly influenced by his job as an antiques dealer, he worked up his forgeries from sketches, photographs, art books and catalogues. He attempted a wide range of crafts, from painting and pastels and watercolors, to sketches, and sculpture, both modern and ancient, busts and statues, to bar relief and metalwork. Sean Greenhog. Sean Greenhall is a British art forger. Over a 17-year period, between 1989 and 2006, he produced a phenomenal range of forgeries. Teaming up with his brother and elderly parents, who fronted the sales side of the operation, he successfully sold his fakes internationally to museums, auction houses, and private buyers, accruing nearly a million pounds. The family have been described by Scotland Yard as possibly the most diverse forgery team in the world, ever. However, when they attempted to sell three Assyrian reliefs using the same provenance as they had previously, suspicions were raised. Apprehended, Sean Greenhall was sentenced to prison for four years and eight months in November 2007. A curator from the Bolton Museum actually visited the family at home prior to the purchase of the Amarna Princess and reported nothing untoward. Yet for all his daring, he once boasted that he could knock up a Moran watercolor in half an hour and claimed to have completed an Amarna statue in three weeks. Sean Greenhall needed the help of his parents. At the trial it was said by the lawyer, Brian McKenna, that his mother, Olive, B. 1925, made the phone calls, because he was shy and did not like to use the telephone. Olive may have been a peripheral figure, but Sean's father, George, born 1923, was more involved. He was the frontman who met face to face with potential buyers. He looks honest, he's elderly and he shows up in a wheelchair. On one occasion, the Victoria and Albert Museum in London held an exhibition of Greenhouse works from January 23 to February 7, 2010. The Metropolitan Police's Art and Antiques Unit built a replica model of the shed where the works were created and labeled Greenhall the most diverse art forger known in history. 
many of his fakes, including the Amana Princess, Risley Park Lanks, and works by Barbara Hepworth and Thomas Moran, were displayed. Family Roles Greenhouse family was involved in the Garden Shed Gang. They established an elaborate cottage industry at his parents' house in the Crescent, Bromley Cross, South Turton, which is about 3.5 miles, 6 kilometers, north of Bolton Town Centre. His parents, George and Olive, approached Clyde. He invested in a vast range of different materials, silver, stone, marble, rare stone, replica metal, and glass. He also did meticulous research to authenticate his items with histories and provenance, for instance, faking letters from the supposed artists, in order to demonstrate his ownership. Completed items were then stored about the house and garden shed. The latter probably served as a workshop as well. A quote from an amazed Scotland Yard detective who searched the house gives a sense of greenhouse industry. A next-door neighbour recalled, I was finding bits of pottery and coins around the edges of the garden over twenty years back, bits of metal with old kings on. While this sounds like materials were openly displayed, it was perhaps not quite that obvious. Angela Thomas 